dismal box office takings, along with both fandom and critics alike hailing Star Trek V The Final Frontier as a huge failure, everyone thought that Star Trek's trek to the movie theaters was now over. But thanks to Star Trek's upcoming 25th anniversary, the original series cast would reunite for one last outing into the Star Trek universe providing them with a much-needed and well-deserved send-off to one of the most inspiring casts of all time. Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information of any given topic in Star Trek. In this, the continuation of our look into Star Trek's history, we'll be taking a look at the making of Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, the final feature film to feature the entire original series cast. I hope you enjoy. Star Trek V was a complete and utter failure at the box office. Not only that, but Paramount Studios had made a string of box office failures, putting the studio deeply in the red. And as a result, Star Trek fandom was resigned to the idea that the final frontier would in fact be final. Star Trek The Next Generation was coming into its own at the time, and with a weekly dose of new Trek for most of the year, Paramount also feared that its popularity would end up making any sixth film an even bigger flop than the fifth was. Frank Mancuso, president of Paramount, refused to believe this, however. Frank had been involved with the Star Trek franchise since Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and desperately felt that the crew of the original series a crew that made Paramount a great deal of money, deserved a proper send-off. And with the 25th anniversary for the franchise up and coming, thought it would be the perfect time for such a farewell. And so, Frank Green lit production on Star Trek VI. Harve Bennett also saw the potential in a 25th anniversary movie, but his idea was a bit different. He wanted a feature film that would show the original series crew back in their academy days, and basically how they'd end up all coming together to eventually serve on board the USS Enterprise. Harv was well aware of Paramount's financial problems, and thought this movie would be a perfect solution, as this movie would only have Shatner and Nimoy show up in basically glorified cameo roles. The savings by doing this alone would allow this Star Trek movie to have a lower budget than its predecessor. Mancuso seeing the potential in savings in Harv's approach greenlit all his ideas. So for nearly 18 months, Harv had begun production on his Academy movie. Gene Roddenberry, whose health had really begun to deteriorate at this point, completely objected to the idea which was no surprise to Bennett, who had learned a long time ago to tune Gene out and just let him ramble on. It was at this point, though, that the real problems began. You see, in all the excitement, no one had bothered to inform the owner of Paramount what the new Star Trek movie was going to be all about. And when he found out, he was furious. Mancuso had sold the idea by saying it was a proper send-off to the original series cast, and when the big boss found out that the movie was all about kids running around saving the galaxy, he immediately scrapped the project and demanded a new movie be written and produced still for the 25th anniversary event. With Mancuso backing down from his support of Harv's idea, Bennett immediately resigned and rode off into the sunset leaving Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry and the powers that be far behind. With Mancuso now in fear of his own job, he began to scramble to find someone to bring this movie together and to bring it together fast, and so he turned to Leonard Nimoy for help. Surprisingly, Nimoy actually had an idea, that being what about a movie that involved the tearing down of the wall in space? 1989 had seen the Berlin Wall, the symbol of the divide between communism and democracy, finally come down with the fall of the USSR. And this idea, something similar happening to the Federation and the Klingon Empire, seemed right up Star Trek's alley, and so Mancuso enthusiastically embraced the idea and set Nimoy to work. Nimoy, though, didn't want to go at this alone, 
and almost immediately requested that Nicholas Meyer, who had directed and helped produce Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, return to Star Trek, and the desperate Frank Mancuso approve this request. A little bit of Trek trivia for you all here is in regards to Gene Roddenberry himself. When Gene saw the movie, he immediately gave everyone a thumbs up on the feature film, but then immediately went back to his office calling his lawyer, Leonard Mazelish, angrily demanding that all the film's more militaristic aspects be cut from the movie. But Gene would end up dying two days later, so as a result, his demands were never seen by Paramount. By the summer of 1990, the pair were deep in planning their new Star Trek movie. However, Paramount itself was undergoing some heavy politics, which would put undue stress on the pair. You see, the powers that be at Paramount were in the middle of a huge power struggle, one so large that the press were covering it, dubbing it the Studio Shuffle. Because of all the nonsense going on at the time with Paramount, Nimoy and Meyer had been forced to take on two additional writers, Lawrence Connor and Mark Rosenthal. And as Nimoy put it, these writers were absolutely horrible, not contributing a single thing to the movie, yet happily taking home a check every week. As if these writers weren't problem enough, the various studio execs, in their own bids to obtain power, would time and time again attempt to pit Nimoy against Meyer and vice versa, something both men only realized later on. Finally though, when the power struggle was over, Connor and Rosenthal were kicked to the curb by Paramount, and Nimoy and Meyer breathed a sigh of relief, figuring their problems were now over. Of course though, they weren't. Thoroughly ticked off with both Paramount and the Star Trek duo, Connor and Rosenthal began legal proceedings in regards to Star Trek VI, and their want to have the sole writing credit for the movie, and they nearly succeeded in stripping all creative and writing credit from Nimoy himself. In the end though, a deal would be struck, where they would be given writing credits on the movie along with Nimoy, even though they had not made a single contribution which had made it into the film. It should also be noted that Frank Mancuso himself would not survive Paramount's power struggle. Being fired about a month after speaking with Nimoy about the sixth film and having 31 years with the studio. Another little bit of Trek trivia for you all here is in regards to the blue food eaten during the dinner scene. The food itself was so disgusting, being pieces of squid dyed blue, that the actors actually refused to eat it. The scene, however, required the actors to enjoy their meal, and appear as though they were in fact eating it. And so, to get the ball rolling, each actor was offered an additional $20 for each bite they took. William Shatner earned a whopping extra $240, though after the take, promptly proceeded to throw up the entire meal. Once the script for Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country was written, and both men were happy with it, they submitted it for approval. And overall, the new powers that be at Paramount were happy with it. But as usually happens at this stage, the stage where the producer goes around getting quotes for the production of the movie, there were many things that would have to be changed because of the budget. Star Trek V had been made with a budget of 27.8 million US dollars. Star Trek VI had been given a budget of 30 million US dollars. Part of the problem with Star Trek V had been the epic scope of the script that simply could not be done in such a small budget. So William Shatner had to make cut after cut to his story and visuals in order to keep the budget in line. And as such, Shatner's movie did in fact suffer for it, a fact that had not escaped Nimoy's attention. As originally written, Star Trek VI would start off with a sort of prologue, a catching up with the crew type of situation. Kirk was to have revitalized his relationship with Carol Marcus. McCoy was to have been making a nuisance of himself by showing up drunk at medical events. Spock's status was to have been shown on screen as classified. Ohura had become a radio show hostess. 
Scotty was working as an engineering professor taking apart the Klingon Bird of Prey from Star Trek 3 and 4, and Chekhov was competing as a not successful chess grandmaster, losing to Betazoids, which was another attempt to tie the original crew to that of the next generation. And Sulu was working as a taxi driver of sorts on some backwater alien colony. So as Nimoy began pricing out everything, he quickly realized that some of the movie had to go, and instead of getting rid of the meat of the story, he instead axed the prologue and started the movie off with a bang, so to speak, having Sulu commanding the USS Excelsior and that starship becoming embroiled in the events of the story. Also, Meyer wanted to have Savick return to Star Trek, placing her as the character which would betray the crew. Again, Roddenberry would throw a fit, citing that no Star Trek officer would ever betray their crew. Meyer, thoroughly fed up with the disruptive and incessant interference of Roddenberry, could not care less what Gene's thoughts were on the matter, telling him, rightfully so, that Savick was his creation, not Roddenberry's, and he could do whatever he pleased with it, and then went on to write that character's betrayal. While watching Star Trek VI, it's pretty obvious that the character of Valeris was originally written as Savick, and it's quite sad that that particular story thread would be lost, as if you think about how much more of a surprising and devastating event the betrayal would be had Savick rather than Valeris been the actual character to have done the betraying. The big thing that Meyer wanted was for Kersey Alley to return to the role. He didn't much care for Robin Curtis's portrayal of the character. But Alley, who was now deep in the Cheers sitcom days, was simply unavailable, even though she would have loved to be in the movie. And so Meyer took that opportunity to rewrite the role for Kim Cattrall to come to Star Trek, the person who he had originally wanted to play Savick back in Star Trek II. Initially, Cottrell turned down the role in Star Trek VI, as she had no interest in playing the character of Savick, being the third actress to don the role. But when it was explained to her that in fact it was a completely different and new role this time, Cottrell jumped at the opportunity. David Warner would return to Trek once again, this time as Chancellor Gorkon. He had played the Federation Ambassador in the previous movie, Star Trek V The Final Frontier. He would go on to play Gal Madred in Star Trek The Next Generation's two-part episode, Chain of Command. Christopher Plummer would join the cast as this film's villain, General Chang. Most people know this amazing actor from the musical The Sound of Music. There's a certain gravitas that Plummer brought to all the roles he had, and his work on this film enhanced every scene that he was in. So much so, that the delivery of the Shakespearean quotes in the movie have become legend to Star Trek fans everywhere. Even I will throw out a random quote done in his delivery style from the movie at random times in my life. Sadly, on February 5th, 2021, we lost this amazing actor. But his almost 70 years of being an actor has ensured his name will live on. And his work in this movie guarantees that Christopher Plummer will always be a household name for Trekkies and Trekkers everywhere. One last little bit of Trek trivia for you all here occurs in the scene where Uhura is speaking Klingon. First, the actress Nichelle Nichols hated the scene, wondering why a communications officer with so many years of experience would have such difficulty with the Klingon language. In her mind, Uhura should have been a competent linguist, and I tend to agree with her. However, her reservations about the scene were overruled and she was told to simply play the scene as it was. And second, the book that Uhura flips through in the scene was actually a 1951 catalog for the Alloy Steel Products Company Incorporated, and the cover, which was added to the catalog, was titled The Introduction to Klingon Grammar, with the word grammar spelt incorrectly. And so, with the main cast on board, Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country would begin full production, but the drama would not end there. And when we next return to part two of the Star Trek VI overview, we'll take a look at these other problems, 
and why, even with these issues, Star Trek VI would still become a successful last outing for the TOS crew. I hope to see you then. Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What do you think of Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country? Do you think it was a proper send-off to the crew that gave fandom so much over the years? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel be or not to be? Don't wait for the translation! Answer me now! Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.